Good afternoon, everybody. The crowds have gathered for the fourth talk on this uh, series of catechesis on discernment. We who are here in person, of course, have the advantage of actually hearing what's going on, and we can also eat the snacks afterwards. We also welcome those who are online. There were five people watching just a moment ago. We have Chloe back, back there doing the operating because Rublin is in the hospital. Last time we had a technical problem. See, the people who were here in person didn't know, but we had a technical problem for those who were watching online. We had video, but no audio. There were eight minutes of silence, just me <laughs> gesturing and moving my lips. So maybe if you could read my lips, you could get something out of it. But uh, for me, it was an unfortunate glitch. Maybe for the, the uh, viewers, it was a nice break. You could just read the handout instead of listening to me. But that's, uh, that's part of the technological world. Uh, another, another thing that the online viewers have to put up with is that the beginnings of these talks are sometimes not completely accessible, maybe because of the system or maybe because it takes time to connect. That's one of the reasons why I don't stand up and start with the sign of the cross. I, I do a little rambling like this so that people have a chance to connect and People who are here have a chance to get their handouts and sit down. And I always want to have everyone with us before we start. So I think we're here. Let's begin with our prayer on this feast day of our Lord Jesus Christ, the eternal high priest. We're going to turn to his mother, our, our queen mother, our lady of the liturgical life. So let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Queen Mother Mary, we come before you, begging an outpouring of grace upon the whole world. Open the eyes of our hearts with your faith. Draw us deeply into the life of the church as we ponder the mysteries of creation, redemption, and sanctification celebrated in your maternal heart. Lead us into the Eucharistic heart of your Son to drink of the inexhaustible fountain of the divine will. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. O sacred heart of Jesus, Eucharistic Heart of Mary, St. Joseph, Father Francis, Sister Barbara. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Welcome again, good afternoon again. Happy feast day. This is the local feast day of our Lord Jesus Christ, the eternal high priest, celebrated on the Thursday after Pentecost. We're still getting used to it, so I'll mention it a few times. Uh, we have to adjust because of the suddenness of its appearance on the calendar. But it becomes part of the very rich uh, banquet of liturgical feast days we have in this time of year, just one celebration after another, from Ascension, then Pentecost, and then we had Mother of the Church, Mary, Mother of the Church, and we had visitation yesterday. Today we had the Feast of uh, Jesus' Priesthood. Then this Sunday we have Holy Trinity, then Corpus Christi. Then in, on into the month of June we have the Sacred Heart and the Immaculate Heart and onward. So it's great to see the liturgy kind of uh, exploding with richness because that's, that's our life. That's the life of the Church. And I like connecting the topic of the liturgy to this topic where covering in this series, this topic of discernment, because they go together very well. Uh, the liturgy doesn't, doesn't discern for us, no. We have to do it ourselves, as we have learned already in this series. D discernment is part of our responsibility uh, to make good decisions. But the liturgy provides us with the nourishment, with the, with the guidance with the input that we need to make good decisions. It gives us the scriptures, first of all, that's the obvious one. 
the readings, but then it gives us the sacraments, it gives us the feast days, it gives us the example of the saints and of a, a blessed mother. So we're not stumbling around in the dark here as we're trying to figure out what, what is the will of God for us or what our, our response to God is. We might feel like we're in darkness at times or in confusion, but we're not. In fact, we just celebrated the great solemnity of Pentecost. How can we not think of the Holy Spirit in relation to discernment? The Holy Spirit. What a, what a vital role the Holy Spirit has in this discernment process. We, we prayed for uh, an outpouring or a renewal of the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. And boy, once you think of them, you can see how obvious it is that they're all related to discernment. Knowledge, wisdom, understanding, counsel, fortitude, piety, fear of the Lord. I mean, my goodness, they're all about discernment. In fact, uh, the last two that I mentioned, piety and fear of the Lord, are very closely connected to the topic we had last time, which was on prayer and wisdom and knowledge and understanding and all the others. They really are related to what we're going to cover today on self-knowledge. So all the gifts are really related to this topic of discernment. Now, yesterday, we celebrated the Feast of the Visitation. How did Mary come up with the idea of traveling into the hill country? It wasn't a normal thing to do for a young woman. And how did she even know it was a good idea? And, and, and how did she know that it corresponded to the will of God for her and that it was for her own good? And how did she make the decision to actually get up and go? Now, we don't usually think of it in these terms or describe it in these terms, but the visitation is certainly fruit of discernment. A, a, de a decision based on an inner conviction of what was the right thing to do. And then once Mary arrived at the house of Zechariah, how did Elizabeth know that Mary was the mother of the Lord? That wasn't discernment. That was inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So that's not exactly it. But, but still, Elizabeth describes an interior process. You remember this from yesterday's gospel. Elizabeth describes this, this, the process she went through. First of all, she felt, not first of all, she heard Mary's greeting, but then she felt this leap within her, the leap of the child in her womb. And it, she became aware of an inner movement now, it's not exactly the same as what we're talking about in discernment because that was the physical movement of another person, <laughs> the unborn child. But it's comparable to what we are, are talking about here because we're talking about being more attentive to inner movements, more attentive to what's going on in our own hearts, listening, self-knowledge, inner sensitivity. That's where we're, we're going here. Okay, let, let's review a little bit. This is a 14-part series. And we're up to today's the fourth part. The first talk was introductory. What does it mean to discern? The second talk was focused on the example of St. Ignatius, founder of the Jesuits. It's good to remember that the lives of the saints teach us a lot about this. We really learn by their experience. We didn't celebrate St. Justin today, but he's another great example. St. Justin, the martyr of the second century. He was a philosopher. He was a pagan philosopher, but he was a searcher, searching for wisdom. He was a discerner, you could say. And when he encountered the gospel, he tested it and thought about it and discerned that this was really the wisdom he had been longing for all along. So St. Justin. But the example in the second talk was St. Ignatius, who had a special gift for understanding and and, and uh, teaching the principles of discernment based on his own personal experience. Remember, he got hit by a cannonball and got laid up for, for a, a few months of, of recovery. And the Lord used that terrible event for something good. It gave him a chance to reflect on the ways of the interior life, which he probably would never have done if he, if he were not injured. Okay, well, th that was talk one and number two. Then the next four talks, I mentioned this last time, are, that, that is talk number three through number six, are all related and they all have a common title, the elements of discernment. There are four elements of discernment in this series. 
So the first element, not surprisingly, is prayer or that, that, that deep interpersonal communion and relationship with the Lord, which Pope Francis referred to as familiarity with the Lord. That was talk number three last time. You might remember what we, what we uh, reflected on last time or what the Pope reflected on last time was about this affective level of our relationship, of our, of our inner life. He said, we're not machines. We're not robots. We have both emotional obstacles and emotional supports to our relationship with God or deciding for the Lord. And then we addressed last time the problems of doubt and fear in drawing close to God because it's common that we hear these lies, uh, these fears arise that it might not be that good for us <laughs> to get too close to God. He might ask too much of us or, or he might ruin our life or ruin our plans. And th those kinds of fears become, become obstacles to our familiarity with God. So that was, that was the, the theme last time. We, we have to trust him. We have to draw close to him. And doing that makes it possible to overcome these kinds of obstacles. You might remember that prayer, uh, hymn, poem from uh, St. Uh, Cardinal Newman, Lead Kindly Light. Lead kindly light amidst the en encircling gloom. You know, even though I'm in darkness here, you can guide me through this step by step. Beautiful little reflection. So that was, that was talk number three, which is the first of the elements of discernment. Okay, the second of the four elements of discernment is what we cover today, self-knowledge. The third one, next time, has the title, The Desire. So it also has to do with what's in us. And then the fourth of the four elements of discernment, which is talk number six, the fourth one is the book of one's own life. So see, these are all connected. <laughs> the, the book of one's own life. We're going to be reading our life. Well, that's self-knowledge also. Okay. So let's go right to the text of Pope Francis. You can follow on the handout. Catechesis on discernment number four. The Elements of Discernment, Self-Knowledge. This is from his general audience on October 5 last year. Dear brothers and sisters, let us continue to explore the theme of discernment. Last time we considered prayer understood as familiarity and confidence with God as an indispensable element. Prayer, not like parrots, but as familiarity and confidence with God. The prayer of children to their father prayer with an open heart. We saw this in the last catechesis. Okay, so that's just review. Today I would like, in an almost complimentary way, to emphasize that good discernment also requires self-knowledge. Knowing oneself. And this is not easy. Indeed, discernment involves our human faculties. Memory, intellect, will, affections. Often we do not know how to discern because we do not know ourselves well enough. And so we do not know what we really want. You have often heard, but that person, why doesn't he sort out his life? He has never known what he wants. Without getting to that extreme, but it happens to us too that we do not know clearly what we want. We do not know ourselves well. Okay, the topic is self-knowledge, and that really sums up the whole talk. Self-knowledge. And I think it's immediately obvious to us that this is a very fundamental need. Uh, there's no growth, there's no maturity, there's no progress, there's no real understanding of anything in the richness of human experience without some basic self-knowledge. Right? And, and awareness that self-knowledge is important is not limited to people who want to learn about discernment. I mean... <laughs> Gosh, any, the most common study, any study in psychology or any kind of course in self-improvement always starts with this idea of self-knowledge. We have to start with who we are and what we know, what we experience, what we remember. And anybody who's taken a, a course in, in uh, ancient history or in or an introductory course of philosophy will remember the expression, know thyself, know thyself. It's a famous maxim of the ancient Greeks know thyself. There was a famous temple in the ancient world 
uh, temple dedicated to the god, pagan god, the Greek god Apollo. And there, there was what was known as the Oracle of Delphi. You probably have heard of this in your school days, the Oracle of Delphi, where people would go to consult the gods. And the Oracle was actually a, a, a woman, a priestess of the god Apollo. And she had some, I, we, I don't know exactly where she would get her stuff, and maybe she didn't know either. Uh, but uh, at the gate of the shrine of the Oracle of Delphi, uh, inscribed on the gate or on the portal was this expression, know thyself, know thyself. And the Greeks interpreted that to mean, in other words, before you go consulting the gods, <laughs> You better know yourself first. Before you, before you get into deep waters, you better know who you are and why you are inquiring and know your limitations. You know, get a realistic picture of, 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 of yourself before you, before you get into something that may be too much for you. I think that's how they interpreted it. And, and Socrates, the great uh, ancient philosopher, approved of this maxim, know thyself, and Plato approved of it. And pretty much everybody uh, down the line uh, it ex expresses this need, it's very basic, know thyself. And I think everybody knows, I assume everybody knows, that this idea of self-knowledge is not merely a matter of learning facts about ourselves, things that we, that we, that we uh, learn and then we're done learning them, like we know the place where we were born, let's say, or you know the name of our grandmother or something like that. Well, yeah, those are important. But once we learn them, we know them, and there's no more to the process. But that's not what uh, the Pope is talking about here, or what knowing thyself is all about. This is not simply learning something about ourselves, but it is, it is an ongoing and cumulative process. It's part of growth in wisdom, in fact. Growth in wisdom. And the Pope says here, this is not easy. Discernment involves our human faculties, memory, intellect, will, affections. So we're talking about all the various dimensions of who we are, all our strengths, all our weaknesses, all our potentials, and all our limitations. All of that is included in self-knowledge. Number two, underlying spiritual doubts and vocational crises, there is, not infrequently, insufficient dialogue between our religious life and our human cognitive and affective dimension. And he, he drops this idea of a vocational crisis on us, <laughs> which is not, it's not really the topic, and it, it seems a little bit of a distraction. I think he's so used to talking to religious people, the priests and, and religious and people in religious life. But his point here is, whatever the spiritual crisis might be, we can't simply spiritualize everything. You can't simply pray away troubling thoughts or problems or feelings or doubts or fears. We have to take, him, take them into account. That's what he says, there's insufficient dialogue. He's talking about an inner dialogue. Uh, we, now, it's true that sometimes after examining ourselves, the, the right response to something that's going on is to say, no, I'm not going to give that thought or that fear, any space, that, that, that is often a right response. But we can't do that until we know what it is that we're saying no to and who it is that's saying no. Now that's where the self-knowledge comes in. Now how can we know what God wants if we don't even listen to ourselves? God does not bypass our humanity, our nature. Grace builds on nature is the principle. God doesn't simply give us spiritual wisdom to live a spiritual life. <laughs> He's dealing with the whole person, and that's what he wants us to deal with. So we don't, God doesn't bypass our humanity, and we sh cannot bypass our humanity either. We, we cannot live as if we were angels in heaven. We're not. A writer on spirituality noted how many difficulties on the theme of discernment are indicative of problems of another kind that should be recognized and explored. So when he says problems of another kind, meaning not just spiritual problems, so-called, but maybe physical limitations or maybe physiological conditions or maybe relationship issues or, or psychological blocks or anything. Then this author writes, here he quotes, 
I have come to the conviction that the greatest obstacle to true discernment and to real growth in prayer is not the intangible nature of God. We're going to be celebrating the Holy Trinity on Sunday. That's the intangible nature of God. It's difficult for us. But that's not, that's not the greatest obstacle, the intangible nature of God. But the fact that we do not know ourselves sufficiently and do not even want to know ourselves as we really are. Almost all of us hide behind a mask, not only in front of others, but also when we look in the mirror. Quote from Thomas Green, Weeds Among the Wheat. We all have the temptation to wear a mask, even in front of ourselves. It's quite a thing to say that almost all of us hide behind a mask, that we all have this temptation to wear a mask even in front of ourselves. It's quite a thing to say, but once it's said, once it's out there, then we have to, to grapple with it. Isn't it true? Isn't it true? It's easy to put that judgment on other people, say all oh, those people there. But he's saying all of us, we have this, this tendency. With, and if we hide even from ourselves, if we're afraid to face ourselves, if we're constantly distracting ourselves, well then how can we grow in relationship with God? That tendency to, to hide also interferes with our relationships with one another. Although sometimes we do have to keep a certain amount of caution with people. Prudence demands it. But with God and with ourselves, we shouldn't have to hide. Well, we do. Now, if we, when we do, we, then we simply can't progress uh, because we're, we're, we're not facing reality, including the reality of ourselves. Now, thinking about this hiding and, um, uh, and uh, wearing a mask, what this brings to my mind is that this is one of the reasons, one of the many reasons why confession is such a great sacrament. Because conf the confessional is the one place where we do our best to remove our mask. And, and we, we look at ourselves and we say things about ourselves that we, that we, that we don't do any other, in any other setting. It's the one place where we remove the mask. It's the one place where we really face the truth or try to. It's a very powerful healing encounter with God, the sacrament of confession. This comment about looking in the mirror It reminds me of an article that I read recently about a young woman. I think she was an actress or a singer or something. Anyway, she was telling the story of her own eating disorder. And she said that when she was a young woman, when she's in early adolescence, maybe 13, 14 years old, she would look in the mirror and she would see a fat, a fat girl. That's what she would see. Even though she's skinny as a toothpick, her perception of herself was that she was fat. And that's why she would not eat. You know this condition. It's a psychological condition or, or some kind of a mental illness. Not, and then, and that, so her issue was not her weight. That was not, wasn't the problem. That was, it, it was her self-perception or her self-knowledge. Her self-knowledge was distorted by something else going on. And that's just one example that came to my mind. Just one example of how a lack of self-knowledge uh, becomes an obstacle for us. That's an extreme, extreme case. Now, I think it's interesting here that the Pope quotes from his fellow Jesuit, Thomas H. Green, is a Jesuit priest. Have some of you know him? You know, he lived in the Philippines. He's dead now, but he lived in the Philippines. Here, that, he, studied, he signed at Ateneo. Anybody know him? I've known people who have gone to him for spiritual direction. Um, anyway, he's a well-known well a speaker and author. He's, he wrote, I think, nine books on prayer and on the spiritual life and spiritual direction. And, and the Pope here quotes from one of them, Weeds Among the Wheat. You know that parable of the weeds and the wheat, which is a parable about discernment. What do you do with these weeds? The subtitle of that book, Weeds Among the Wheat, here's a copy of it right here. Weeds Among the Wheat. The subtitle is Discernment, Where Prayer and Action Meet. It's such a book about discernment. No wonder the Pope picked this up when he was preparing this talk. Discernment where prayer and action meet. Thomas Green. Should I take the time to share my one Thomas Green story? 
<laughs> I, I can't say I met him, but I did see him in person, and it was with Father Francis. I'll, I'll tell this story, because I think it's, it's part of Anuwim history, too. This way back in mid-1990s, Father Francis was always writing and, and you know, trying to convey the Anuwim spirituality. So in, back in 95 or 96, he wrote a long, complex paper on the mysticism of Our Lady of the Liturgical Life or on the mysticism of Our Queen Mother or something. Uh, and some of you might know some of his, uh, what we call now pastoral letters, but they were attempts to write down and convey the spirituality of living the liturgy in the heart of Mary. And so he wrote this thing out. It was, it was, nobody could figure out what to do with it. And he said, I need some input. I need some, someone to evaluate this, which is good. That's good for discernment. You don't just keep what you have. And, so uh, I think it was Monsignor Ramirez who referred him to Father Green, because Father Green is a well-known expert in spiritual direction and, and prayer in the spiritual life. So Father Francis and I hopped into the old red Tamarau, and I drove him to Ateneo campus. I, that's the only time I've ever been on the campus of Ateneo. And so we drove in there, said we're looking for Father Green, and then he's at the seminary, he's at the seminary. So it, I, Ateneo campus is huge. <laughs> it's huge. So, there's uh, buildings and roads. and uh, So we, we drove to a building we were told was the seminary. We went inside. Where's Father Green? And they, they said, oh, no, he's over at, I don't remember what, one of them is Loyola Seminary and one of them San Jose Seminary and one of this. And, so we, anyway, we're in the wrong building, wrong part of the campus. We drove over to, we found Father Green and Father Francis and Father Green had a long session. I was sitting in the lobby or someplace. I, I, I saw Father Green, but Father Francis and Father Green talked for a while. And the result of it was, Father Green said, well, this is something more like a theology. You should get a, a theologian's review, not just a, a spiritual director. So he said, you should talk to Father Chito. Uh, he, he teaches here on campus, Father Chito Tagli. So, so he went, at, and Father Chito was teaching a class, maybe in that building or somewhere on the campus, and we found him. And <laughs> Father Francis knocked on the door while he's lecturing to his seminarian students. And Father Chito came over and said, yes, Father, what can I do for you? And Father Francis said, I have this paper I'd like you to review. And he said, well, I, you know, I can't do it right now. I'm in the middle of a lecture. Uh, why don't you come and see me? So they made an appointment to visit Father Chito. He was a, a rector down in, uh, up, or up in Tagaytay at the time, at the Tahanan ng Mabuting Pastol. And so maybe a week later, got back into the Red Tamarau drove to Tagaytay and uh, Father Francis presented the paper to Father Chito, who is now Cardinal Chito uh, Tagli in Rome. Anyway, that's, that's the Father Green story. Just a little bit of history. <laughs> let's go back to here. Let's go back to, uh, and it was an attempt at discernment, uh, you know, get input from people who can help us. Let's go back to the document here. Number three, forgetting God's presence in our life goes hand in hand with our ignorance of ourselves. Ignoring God and ignoring ourselves. Now, forgetting and ignoring is a little bit different. I guess it's not crucial for this, but to forget is something maybe involuntary, and to ignore means we don't want to know. But anyway, ignoring ourselves, ignorance of our personality traits and of our deepest desires. Knowing oneself is not difficult, but it is laborious. Now, he said in paragraph number one that it's not easy And here he says, it's not difficult. Well then, <laughs> what does he mean? He means we can do it, but it takes effort. It's work. So it's not too hard to do, but it does take effort. It entails, so it's, uh, it is laborious. It entails patient soul searching. Good expression, soul searching. It requires the capacity to stop, to deactivate the autopilot. It, to acquire awareness of our way of acting, of the feelings that dwell within us, of the recurrent thoughts that condition us, often unconsciously. I love that expression, deactivate the autopilot. <laughs> you, you immediately get what it is. Uh, yeah, the autopilot is the momentum, you know, we get caught up in what we're doing, get caught up in the maybe thoughtless activity or the busyness of the day, and to deactivate that momentum is to take charge once again by stepping back, uh, this is what we do when we pray, isn't it? We, we pray, we acknowledge that God is in charge and that maybe not everything that we're doing is in accord with what he wants us to do. So 
opening to God, but in, in this case we're focusing on not only reopening ourselves to God, but becoming aware of ourselves. These two go together, and this is clear from the last week and this, uh, two weeks ago and this week, knowing God and knowing ourselves, it goes together. It also requires, this uh, self-knowledge also requires that we distinguish between emotions and spiritual faculties. Emotions are what happens to us by nature. Spiritual faculties are things that we do, the thought and, 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 and choice. I feel, that's an emotion, is not the same as I am convinced. That's spiritual faculty, well, uh, thinking or reason. I feel is not the same as I am convinced. I feel like is not the same as I want. I want, he's implying there's decision involved, whereas I feel is just emotion. Thus, we come to recognize that the view we have of ourselves and of reality is at times somewhat distorted. To realize this is a grace. This is sometimes the reason why we hide behind a mask is that we don't want to realize that we have a distorted view of reality. But it's better to take off the mask, see where the distortion is, and that's how we grow. It's a grace. Indeed, very often it can happen that erroneous convictions about reality based on past experiences strongly influence us, limiting our freedom to strive for what really matters in our lives. I think we know this is true. Strong emotions or, or, or uh, memories can, can make it difficult for us to recognize present realities. Well, an extreme case of this is the, is the current explosion of the transgender people. You know, these, these people really do feel, on an emotional level, that they are not the gender of their actual body. That's really how they feel. They're not lying. That's quite an erroneous conviction about reality, to use the words of the Pope. It's an erroneous conviction about reality. And as he says, it limits our freedom to strive for what really matters. Now, now that's a topic for another time to talk about transgenderism, but it does show how the emotions can completely overpower our higher faculties to the point where we have a complete break or a disconnect from reality, higher faculties of the mind and the will. Number four, living in the computer age, we know how important it is to know passwords in order to get into programs where the most personal and valuable information is stored. Remember your password? <laughs> don't you ever open a program and it asks for the password? You say, oh, what's the password? I don't remember. You can't get in to that deeper level without the password. But our spiritual life, too, has its passwords. There are words that touch our heart because they make reference to what we are most sensitive to. Now, when he, use, he uses the word passwords, and we think of the, the, what we use on the computer, we, we shouldn't limit what he's talking about simply to words. Any thought, any memory, any fantasy, any dream that that touches our hearts, that can trigger a strong reaction. It's not just a word, in other words. It's, it's a something, it's an interior something, and it triggers a reaction, either positive or negative. And it's not just spiritual things. You just think of your favorite food. Well, I said, oh, I'd love to. You know, it makes you think of, oh, I'd love to have that. Or think of your, a song that you've found deeply moving or a, a place where, that you associate with happy memories. Those are, those are passwords. Or, on the negative side, think of a traumatic event from your past. The, the, as soon as you think of it, or somebody mentions it, the fear or the anger comes welling back up again. It's not far below the surface. Now, I know all this stuff is usually thought of as the world of psychology, but here we're recognizing it as material of our spiritual life. We have to relate to the, to the passwords. The tempter, that is the devil, knows these key words well, these passwords well. And it is important that we know them too, so as to not find ourselves where we do not want to be. It's kind of a mild way of saying it could be led down the, a bad road, a dead-end road, or where we don't want to be. Temptation does not necessarily suggest bad things, but often haphazard things presented with excessive importance. In this way, 
it hypnotizes us, the temptation. It hypnotizes us with the attraction that these things stir in us, things that are beautiful but illusory, that cannot deliver what they promise, and therefore leave us in the end with, the sense, with a sense of emptiness and sadness. Just pause on that idea. Temptation is not necessarily uh, triggered by something bad. It can be something that has excessive importance to us. That's why some people are tempted by things that, are, that don't tempt others, because we don't have the same passwords. <laughs> so something that we put a lot of hope in, or, or something that we, that, we, that, that we tell ourselves, or we are told that it will make us happy, or that it will uh, satisfy us, or somehow complete us, of course it can't. Of course it can't. And it's not necessarily the fault of the thing itself. It's, it's that our expectation is, that means something within us is disordered. Let's continue here. That sense of emptiness and sadness is a sign that we have embarked on paths that were not right, that disoriented us. They can be, for example, degrees, careers, relationships, all things that are in themselves praiseworthy, but towards which, if we are not free, we risk harboring unreal expectations, such as confirmation of our worth. See what he's talking about there, confirmation of our worth. I'll be worth something if I have this degree, if I have this career, if I have this relationship. I'll, uh, if I achieve this, if I have that, then I will be a somebody. No, you won't. <laughs> no, that, it's a false or an unreal expectation. For example, when you think of a course of study you are undertaking, do you think only of promoting yourself, of your own interests, or also to serve the community? What's the motive? What, what's, it, it's a good thing, but is it good for you? And are you doing it for a good reason? There, one can see the intentionality of each one of us, intentionality is more motivation or intention. You can see what's behind what we're doing. The greatest suffering often comes from this misunderstanding because none of those things can be the guarantee of our dignity. Okay, so that's, that's paragraph number four, which just to summarize it, he says there are these passwords, these keys to our inner life, and they're connected to both a, a, a negative direction and a positive one. They can, be, they can be used for temptation and sin, that's what the tempter does, the evil one does, or they can be used for a proper discernment and for our spiritual growth. And so we need to know what sort of things are, are, have the tendency to lead to unreal expectations in our hearts. Number five, that is why, dear brothers and sisters, it is important to know ourselves, to know the passwords of our heart what we are most sensitive to, in order to protect ourselves from those who present themselves with persuasive words to manipulate us. But also, that's the negative side, uh, manipulation, but also to recognize what is truly important for us, distinguishing it from current fads or flashy, superficial slogans. <clears throat> and just think again of, of St. Ignatius here. At first, he didn't distinguish between what was uh, uh, pleasurable to his flesh and what was truly important. B both gave him a kind of pleasure, all right? Reading uh, the knights, about knights and chivalry and reading about the, the Christ and the saints, both. The Pope mentions the current fads and the flashy superficial slogans. Well, the current fad in St. Ignatian's time uh, was these stories of knights and chivalry and you know what appeals to men is the idea of uh, uh, victory in a, in a hard-fought battle and then winning the affection of the beautiful princess and all that. So that's, what, that, that's, that's the fad and that's kind of a fad to this day. Just look at uh, the television series or fantasy series. <clears throat> Many times what is said in a television program in some advertisement touches our hearts and makes us go that way without freedom. Be careful about that. Am I free? Or do I let myself be swayed by the feelings of the moment or the provocations of the moment? This is saying the same thing again. It's the importance of distinguishing between these two. One leads to freedom, 
It's like St. Ignatius, reading about the saints, not led to freedom. Another leads to a kind of slavery, which, a kind of slavery which is at first appealing because it does appeal to us, but in the long run leaves us empty and sad. Number six, an aid in this, an aid in this work of uh, distinguishing or of, of discernment is an examination of conscience. But I am not talking about the examination of conscience that we all do when we go to confession. No. That is, but I sinned in this, that. No, a general examination of conscience, I put in there the word examen. I, that, the, the Pope didn't put that in there. I put that in there just to distinguish. A general examination of conscience or an examen of the day. What happened in my heart during this day? Now, I just want to note why I put that word examen in there because we're talking about two different things that are sometimes referred to with the same uh, expression or same term, examination of conscience. Most people, almost everybody, when they hear the term examination of conscience, will think of looking at our sins in preparation to go to confession. Or maybe at the end of the day, repenting of our sins of the day. That's right. That's very important. It's necessary, in fact. Because if we don't examine our conscience, we can't repent. And if we can't repent, then we don't go to confession and we can't be freed of our sins. So that's really important. And the conscience knows where we have gone off track. Yes. He's talking about something else, which he calls examination of conscience, but he means this other thing, which I'm calling examen, because that's what I was taught. <clears throat> examen, sometimes used, sometimes the expression is consciousness examen. So consciousness, not conscience. Uh, or sometimes it's examination of consciousness. So it's a different thing, related, but it's different. Not limited to to acknowledging what I did wrong, it might include that, of course, but it's something broader. It's, it's more of a deepening of our awareness of what is happening in our inner life. After all, there's more to life than avoiding sins and being sorry for sins. That, that's part of life, but there's a lot more going on in us than simply avoiding or falling into sins. So the question is, what happened in my heart? And then he, continuing what he says, what happened in my heart during this day? Well, lots of things happened. Which? Why? What traces did they leave in my heart? Carrying out an examination of conscience, he means here the examen, consciousness examen, is the good habit of calmly rereading what happened during our day, learning to note in our evaluations and choices what we give most importance to, what we are looking for, and why, and what we eventually find. See how it's more than just examining the right and wrong, but it's all the movements and what, what, what of importance, of significance happened. Above all, it helps us learn to recognize what satisfies our hearts. What satisfies my heart? Great question. In fact, I thought of choosing this as one of the reflection questions, but then I, I realized it would be very hard to answer or, or, or talk about what satisfies my heart. That's, that's something maybe to ponder. What satisfies my heart? For only the Lord can give us confirmation of what we are worth. He tells us this every day from the cross. He died for us to show us how precious we are in his eyes. There is no obstacle or failure that can prevent his tender embrace. The examination of conscience, this consciousness examine, helps a great deal because in this way we see that our heart is not a road where everything passes without us knowing about it. We're not as blind as that. It's not all automatic. We have this faculty of consciousness, of inner reflection, and we need to exercise it. We need to deliberately do it. That's why these are spiritual exercises. Now, since I'm talking to Anuan people who are regularly trying to practice pondering the word, you can probably see how, this, how, how pondering is closely related to this, this uh, examen. Because when we're pondering the word, God is speaking in the scriptures. God is speaking. Yes, that's the guarantee. But the question is not, is God speaking? But the question is, what, what am I experiencing when I hear his word? 
what is he saying to me? And how am I reacting? What's going on in me as he speaks? That's pondering. Part of the, part of the active listening process that we talk about as prayer is really distinguishing what's going on in us. What's going on inside. So we're, we're not, our heart is not simply a footpath that stuff falls on it. That's what he says. We're not, how does he say it? The heart is not a road where everything passes without us knowing about it. If that were true, then the birds of the air can come and eat up everything that falls on us. That's not, that's not it. No, our heart is not a footpath. We see what passed by today. We have this awareness. We have this capacity to be aware. What passed by today? What happened? What made me react? What made me sad? What made me joyful? What was bad and how did I harm others? It is about seeing the path my feelings took, the attractions in my heart during the day. Don't forget, the other day we talked about prayer. Today we're talking about self-awareness. This is the two sides of the coin. Now, prayer, familiarity with God is knowledge of God. Self-awareness is knowledge of self. And they go together. Number seven, prayer and self-knowledge, these two, enable us to grow in freedom. This is to grow in freedom. He repeats it. These are the basic elements of Christian existence, precious elements for finding one's place in life. Thank you. Now, we're going, to go, we're going to talk more about these in the next two, because the next two elements about desire and reading the book of one's life will return to some of these basic points. But you can see what he's talking about here, basic elements of discernment, which lead to freedom, freedom so that we can respond to God's grace. I don't know if I should take time to give a personal example, but uh, yeah, maybe it's not too late. Today's feast gave me a, uh, an example because I really had to wrestle with a strong inner reaction to this feast of our, uh, of our Lord Jesus Christ, the eternal high priest. Of course, it's a good thing. It's a beautiful mystery, a glorious mystery. But I had this inner resistance to it. And I had to figure out, what is this? Why, what, what's, wrong, what's wrong with me? Or what's going on in me? It's a real discernment process. And part of it, of course, is my own flesh. You know, my, I don't like to change things. I don't like to do extra work. I was embarrassed that the Anuam way had the wrong readings. And that's, that's, not, that's not coming from uh, the right movements in the spirit. That's just my nature. But then, as I sorted it out, I said, well, I can set that aside. I said, no, but there's still a disorder here. There's a disorder in how the feast was has been forced upon us without any kind of warning, without any preparation, without any liturgical formation, without any explanations, without any resources. That's bad liturgy. So I, I use that. I said that already this morning. So uh, after we spent weeks reading Desiderio, Desideravi, about liturgical formation, about the Ars Celebrandi, the art of celebrating the liturgy, about how the liturgy forms us, then we, then we get this, this uh, kind of shocking uh, change without any preparation, and that's bad. That's bad uh, liturgical practice. It's not a bad feast. It's just bad how it was done. So uh, you have to prepare the soil before you drop seeds on it. Otherwise, it's not going to bear any fruit. Okay, just just a personal example of a kind of discernment that I had to go through to figure out to sort out the beauty of the feast uh, and the and my own problems and you know negative reactions, and then objectively see that there was, there's still something not, uh, there's something disordered about how it was done. Okay, summary of the Holy Father's words, you can read on your own, it's clear. Let me, let me go to the questions. First question comes, uh, a quotation from paragraph number two, actually it's a quotation from Father Thomas Green. We do not know ourselves sufficiently and do not even want to know ourselves as we really are. Almost all of us hide behind a mask, not only in front of others, but also when we look in the mirror. Do you think this is true? Do you think this is true? Is it true of you? Why do you not know yourself sufficiently? This is, this is where the, 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 this quotation from Father Green, the Pope Francis picks out is, or, what about this problem of being or this, or this phenomenon of being masked. Why do you not know yourself sufficiently? What obstacles can you identify that hinder your discernment and growth in prayer? Good questions. Number two, a quote from paragraph number five, be careful about that. Am I free 
or do I let myself be swayed by the feelings of the moment or the provocations of the moment? So the question is, do you know the difference between the freedom he's talking about and being swayed by the feelings of the moment? But of course you do. <laughs> I don't mean to say you don't know. Everybody knows uh, something about freedom and we know when you make free decisions, even when we're afraid or when we're angry or, or distracted or whatever, we know when we make free decisions. And we also know the experience of getting caught up in emotions that seem to take us over and then, or an, even enslave us, we know that. So we know what it's like not to be free. So I, I, when I say, do you know the difference? I'm saying reflect on the difference between freedom and enslavement to the feelings. Share a personal example of each experience. So a personal example of experience of freedom, no matter what the emotions or feelings are, and then the feeling or experience of being uh, enslaved or swayed or overpowered by feelings. Third question comes from paragraph number six. It's all about this examen. What is your experience of the, this practice of the general examination of conscience or consciousness examen in which you reflect on what happened in your heart during the day? So when I say what's your experience of it, is it new to you? Have you ever heard of it? Um, or is it old and very familiar and you do it every day? Or is it something that you might have heard of and tried it and don't do it anymore? Or maybe just, just say, what, what, what do you know of this, this uh, typically Ignatian exercise that he brings up, the examen? <clears throat> Perhaps it's already part of your pondering of the word. I, I think in a lot of Anuwan people, that's where, that's the closest we get to this kind of awareness of what's going on in the heart. Take a moment, this is for our, when we get a moment of silence here, take a moment to apply this practice to your day so far. Okay, so we're, we've been up for whatever it is, eight hours, ten hours, and uh, what has happened within you in the day so far? What has made you react? What has given you joy? What's given you sadness? What's attracted you? What's repulsed you? What good or bad decisions have you made? So take a moment to do this kind of examination. And then, if it's appropriate, I have here, briefly share one insight from your examen. So take, take a time of silence and make this review of today, today, June 1st. Now, you might think of things that you don't want to share, naturally, but, uh, but if, if, if you have something to share from that examen, something that, that uh, stands out in your consciousness, your awakened consciousness, then share that in the groups. Okay? So that's, that's it. Those are the questions. Um, before we stop here, let me remind you, we, we got the update on the... Uh, on the prayer chain, although Rubelin wasn't on that list, but she's still on our prayer chain. Uh, so Leah, Abel, Edna, Thelma, and your brother Rudy, all, all in a stage of recovery or treatment, so it's all good, but still all continuing need of prayer. We'll be meeting again on June 15, two weeks from today, and we're gonna take the third element of discernment the desire. The title is The Desire. Birthdays in June. Well, the only birthday in the first half of June is Edna. Her birthday is this Sunday, June 4. Grace's birthday is later in the month, 19th. Didith, Carmen, Lulu, all later in the month. Okay. Let's, let's have a closing prayer. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, speak and move in our hearts. Make us good listeners. Grant that we may know ourselves and continue to grow in self-knowledge so that we may also know you. Bless all our priests on this feast day and continue to use them to guide us all in the way of holiness. Mary, our mother, teach us how to listen, how to ponder, 
that we may grow in self-knowledge and that we may recognize the will of God. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good afternoon, everybody.